Happy Monday, everyone. This is Martha with Nature Niche, and I'm coming to you uh, from the residential backyard of Dr. Tim Fredericks, uh, and he works for Bear, and he's going to share the story of his um, wildlife habitat in his own yard. Yeah. So welcome, welcome to St. Louis. Uh, so we're in St. Charles, Missouri. A little bit of a poke for you from <laughs> Michigan, but um, actually. My, my graduate research was in Midland where, where you guys are from. So it's great you got to make some connections and come visit. So I do, I work for Bear Crop Science. I'm an environmental engagement manager, which really ties in really well with what we like to do at home and sort of bringing conservation home to, uh, to our yard. And, and we really enjoy the habitat. So we're standing in the middle of a prairie that we started about eight years ago, um, just on the, in the side yard of our house. Uh, and so what, what I do at work is uh, I'm a, I work with education and outreach for conservation uh, within the agricultural landscapes. So we're partnering with NGOs and, and corporations and groups that, uh, that put habitat on the landscape. Uh, and we work with them, again, within the agricultural landscape and then really educating people about the benefits of having a diverse landscape uh, in the communities we live in. And tell us a little bit about why you planted native plants in your own backyard. Right. So, I don't know, you can kind of peek a little bit and you can see it, all the stuff flying around us yeah. here, but like butterflies, moths, bees, we've really, in my opinion, displaced a lot of the, the native fauna that was here, right? And so we're, we've, we've really suburban or urbanized the environment. And in doing so, we took away a lot of this habitat that was here uh, and so I'm taking areas of my yard that really we didn't have a great use for and it was in lawn. Mm -hmm. And so we converted it into a habitat that I mean, gets a lot of use from from not only the, the pollinators, but also I mean, the birds come through on migration and they're eating the seeds that these plants are making. Um, kick a rabbit out of here every once in a while and you get some mammals living in here as well. So it all it all ties together. and creating habitat where we where we took habitat for uh, for species that are important in the environment. Nice. Can you speak a little bit to what you've established? And it sounded like you did potting and seeding. Yeah, so a lot of, so what we're standing in now is largely seeded. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we did have lawn. We, we killed that lawn with uh, with a herbicide and mm -hmm. prepared the area. And then we, we overseeded in the winter. So a dormant seeding. Mm -hmm which is important so that the the winter, so that rain and snow can work that seed into the ground and get good soil seed contact. Uh, and then really your the joy of growing plants begins, right? And yeah. so now it didn't look like this the first three years, right? <laughs> right. Like we're year eight at this point. So it's well established. Yep. That first year um, we chose to hand weed. And so we took the incentive to like know what our weeds were and which species were in. So we had a ton of mare's tail. Uh, so that first season we pulled mare's tail. Uh, and largely, I mean, now we're just managing for specific species and taking species out that, I mean, are, are perfectly spreader. fine. Yeah. They spread well, yeah. but maybe we don't want as much of that. And mm -hmm. so now we just manage the species competence, uh, composition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you mentioned potting. So some of the plants like we'll add in either as a, a potted plant in the fall, if we can, it's the best because you get a longer season for it to get some roots under it. Uh -huh. um, or if we plant stuff in the spring, like a lot of native plant sales, you're getting, you're getting plants in the spring right? and you do have to baby those. So like these plants, everything here does not get irrigated. Like there's no water. I don't water, but I will baby transplants the first season. Sure. And so I, we actually use like surveyor flags and we'll flag those. And then I've got a reminder on my phone, come out every week water. and we hand water. Okay. Just, but it's just those plants that get sure. hand watered, right? Yep. Everything else is just yep. whatever happens, happens Na out natural here. Natural rainfall. Yep. Okay. And I noticed that you have lots of goldenrod um, and New England aster out here. You told me about cup plant, some other things I wasn't familiar with, blue sage. Yeah. Um, just the diversity and then things that bloom in the spring like wild columbine and anemone and so there's some crossover with what we have growing in um in michigan as well so yeah i love the diversity that you've been able to yeah and and that's one of the the keys right when you establish habitat you think about the bloom and the bloom period right so a lot of people break it into like early spring bloomers the summer bloomers uh -huh. and then the, the fall bloomers 
Uh, and so you want multiple plants during each of those windows that are gonna provide nectar or, uh, or pollen for, for the pollinators and, and the plants, or the, and, and the pollinators during that window, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you just, with your background, can you talk to us a little bit about responsible pesticide use at home and kind oh, of yeah. recommendations? So for sure, we uh, so you heard we use we use herbicide to to really kill back the existing lawn and vegetation that we had in this place, right? Uh, and so what you want when I'm when I'm doing that, I'm using something that doesn't have a residual. So you're thinking about what you're killing and, and what you want the effects of that to be. So there are some herbicides that are like like you think of something that's called like a ground clear or like a 360 protection. So anytime you see something like that. It's gonna have something to kill what's there, but also prevent germination of new plants. Okay. So obviously I'm planting this, I wouldn't want to use something like that, right? With residual control. Is that a tr like pre-emergent? Yeah, so it'd be a yeah. pre-emergent. You could, okay. you could do, but this is more of like longer term residual. So that's gonna okay. have a residue that stays in that soil surface ah. that'll control anything that germinates. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing as a pre-emergent. You would mm -hmm. put that down to, so a lot of people would equate that to crabgrass. Ah, so you put okay. down a pre-emergent for crabgrass in the spring in your lawn. Okay. And that's really what they're doing. That's going to be a granular. It's going to water in uh, and then prevent crabgrass from germinating. Okay. Um, but some of the considerations that I think about is you're, you're thinking about, like I kind of mentioned, is what, do you, what, do you, what is your goal? Right. And then think of the chemistry that you're going to, that's going to accomplish your goal. Okay. Um, and so that's for plants. But I mean, it same thing goes for insects or or anything else that you're looking to control within your your home environment. So for us, like termites is something, or like okay. ants that would get into your house, or a lot of people control grubs in their soil um, to prevent moles, uh -huh. right? Or to, to keep that under control. And But anything, I mean, it's it's a side, right? It's gonna be killing things. Yep. So you need to be, just, just be thoughtful, right? Like, so be thoughtful in what you're choosing and what you're using, mm -hmm. but also think about your safety and the safety of, the other critters that would be around right so right. like i wouldn't want to use an insecticide in this habitat right like i'm, I'm obviously promoting pollinators yes. um and so i wouldn't want to use an insecticide but maybe along the foundation of my house where i could have a controlled application mm -hmm. you could spray a foundation and really there's no reason for a pollinator to be there right so again it's exposure and toxicity mm -hmm. so you're taking the exposure away because you're not putting it in a place that they would get in contact with it okay but those ants that are coming in the house right would be exposed to it there right, right. Yep. Uh, and then the last thing i'll mention is just the label the label is crazy important it's crazy yes. important for it'll list the species that are controlled yep. and the, like so the, the the, the where and the why you should use it mm -hmm. um and some some insecticides like you might use in a garden environment for like vegetable plants mm -hmm. but others you might use on um like a bedding plant to protect it from something and those aren't always right equivalent right like right. you don't use those in both places so yeah reading the label and it's also gonna have the safety information for you to keep you safe yeah. and to keep the environment safe and the and the non-target species so i mean right. following the label and really realizing that the label's on there for your protection and, and for you to help you use that in the best way you can. Right, so that helps you with correct concentration, correct PPE, right. uh, temperature, wind conditions. When to use it, yeah, right, all, all of that. Of the things. environmental conditions, uh -huh. your safety, so like maybe gloves, maybe goggles. Right. A lot of times it's long sleeves and long pants. I see so many people walking and, and spraying their shorts and their <laughs> tivas, right? And, yep, yep, don't do that. Uh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then you had mentioned, I know I, we were by his uh, Monarch Way Station sign, but you're also um, certified through Bring Conservation Home. Do you want to yeah. talk about how that organization helped you? Oh man, it was great. So we were new to St. Louis. We, we knew we wanted to do something like this. And we started looking for programs and resources to like okay. get information and help us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what this is a local St. Louis program through the Audubon Society where they're really looking to get this type of habitat and diverse habitats into homeowners to bring conservation home. Mm -hmm. um, and so what they have, I mean, what I'll say is for anyone anywhere, find somebody, there's a resource in your area that you could lean on that will have information, whether it's a national organization or a local organization mm -hmm. to help you with the information. So mm -hmm. they talked us through like some invasive, some exotics, like plants that you really don't want to have. And so how to get rid of those. Uh -huh but also sort of almost gave us a prescription, like walked the yard with us, looked at what we had, looked at the space and gave us recommendations for plants. Nice. 
and where to put them. Mm -hmm. And so one thing I will mention is, I think we talked about a pawpaw plant. Uh -huh. So I've got a pawpaw in that corner of my yard and I've got one over there in that corner of my yard. So right plant, right place. And yep. so on those seed, on those plant tags, you're going to see like sun exposure, water, yep. like nutrient, what type of soil. So like when you put the right plant in the right place, it's going to produce and it's going to do well. And you're right. not going to need to baby it with water. You're not going to need to put fertilizers down or insecticides right. on it or that. I mean, they really flourish when they have what they need yeah. um, from right. either the environment or in the soil. Yeah. So it's, yeah, hopefully. So yeah, we'll helping. That. I mean, they were a great resource, and I think we talked a little bit about um, Doug Talami's Homegrown National Park Program, right. which yep. is another... It's a great resource. And great idea, right? Just the concept of, like, conservation can be in our backyards and can right. be part of what we do if we let it. And there's because, resources like, for it doing has, it. It has to be if we're going to save our native species. Right. Our, our uh, national parks can't do it all on their own. That are, so the concept there is really yeah. like if we all came together and put in a little bit of habitat in all of our yards. Yeah. Uh, and I think he focuses on east of the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So we're a little bit west of the Mississippi, right. yep. but only a couple miles. <laughs> but uh, the idea is you would have the largest national park in, in America if we if everybody put in a little bit of habitat right. in their own yards. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much for sharing your property and your thoughts with us today. And um, I hope that encourages you to do some wildlife habitat and native plantings in your own yard. Take care and have a good week. As a side note to this post, I thought everyone might enjoy seeing the pollinator prairie in its full extent. It is quite a diverse planting with lots of um, habitat structures as well. So here's an example of a birdhouse that Tim put on the back of his Bring Conservation Home credential sign. And uh, I love the reuse of the Michigan license plate there on the roof of that uh, bird nesting box. He also had some tunnel nesting bee um, supplementary habitat and cut some uh, stem bundles. I believe that was milkweed. And I just wanted to share some of the wildlife that we saw while we were out there filming the post. Uh, there were some lovely uh, sulfur butterflies flitting around still, um, lots of bumblebee activity. And um, one thing I didn't capture on film, but right before we started posting, one of Tim's neighbors actually stopped by to thank him for um, creating wildlife habitat in their neighborhood um, and for doing the, the pollinator planting and, and talking to fellow neighbors about what he's doing. So I just, I thought that was a really neat thing to happen uh, right before we uh, shot this post and wanted to share that as well. So you can see the sulfurs flying around. There's another birdhouse on the back of the um, Monarch Way Station sign. We did see a Monarch too, I just wasn't fast enough to get it on camera. Um, but certainly lots of bee activity. We saw bumblebees and carpenter bees. That's a little skipper. Um, and uh, of course, uh, honeybees as well, all, all actively working over the New England aster and goldenrods in the prairie. I hope you find this interview with Tim helpful and the example uh, useful in trying to think about what you can do in your own residential landscape to support our native pollinators and wildlife in our own backyards.